Love Connie as a warm, interested, friendly girl who's just a phone call away. She's been getting ready to meet you and is standing by. She's ready to take your call right after this episode of Manhattan Cable. Manhattan Cable goes all over the world. Manhattan Cable, a series produced by World of Wonder in the early 90s. Madonna! Manhattan Cable collects the wildest clips from New York's public access and takes us back to a time when New York was dirty, filthy, and oh so fun. TV to die for, ladies and gentlemen. On episode three of Manhattan Cable, Ed Koch chokes. Like that. Cordana vogues, and we ask the age-old question, would Nancy Reagan be caught dead in this? Come on along, will ya? Good evening, you're on the air. That which is dead is alive forever. Bragadam, bam, bam. So how is everybody tonight? Hello, I'm Laurie Pike, back with another edition of Manhattan Cable. As usual, we'll be showing you a selection of clips from Manhattan's three public access channels where anyone can have their own television program and have it shown without censorship. We'll also be bringing you some stories about the wilder side of Manhattan that we shot just for you. If this show were a pizza, it would have extra cheese, extra pepperoni, extra anchovies, and of course it would be deep dish. time on the metro rail today? I can't. Um, be first, the kingdom of God. <laughs> shall be added unto you. Okay. I hope y'all really What does that mean? What? Y'all guys have some messed up minds. We have messed up minds? Maybe you should learn a little tolerance. No, maybe you should learn to be a man, a real man. Oh, I am a real man. Do you have a problem with men wearing women's clothing? Homo homophobia is the same as racism. No, we don't want the Bible because you're spreading bigotry and hatred. No, I'm not. I'm spreading Homophobia the is the same as racism. The word of God can deliver you from the spirit the same, of our violence. The same <laughs> racist establishment that... Help me on TV. Yeah. You are on TV. I'm on, I'm on Channel 32 Live. Yay! Well, not live, but it will well, be on Wednesday at 10.30. Wednesday yeah, at 10.30? Long. You need Jesus Christ as your personal savior if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you know the same racist establishment that hates... That's not a racist. That that hates this this government that hates black people that hates latino people people of color hates gay people do you don't think that god made gay people you don't think that no god made adam and eve not adam and eve well then you're homophobic face lifts collagen lips cheek implants and nose jobs are everywhere in New York. And although the end results are very beautifying, the immediate effects are not quite so pretty. You know, plastic surgery has finally come out of the closet. In fact, in New York, it's very chic to talk about what you've had done to yourself. But one thing that's still kept a very big secret is the recovery period. Women who want their body renovations to be kept under wraps can now recuperate at Apre Cosmetique, a new luxury post-operative retreat on the Upper East Side. What we provide is some tender loving care, lots of pampering, and a reassuring feeling that somebody's with you at all times and you're never alone. And the patient is picked up in the limousine, driven to the retreat. She enters the, our retreat through a rear entrance in a courtyard, so she's never seen anywhere in the public. 
comes up to our uh, through the elevator into our lovely apartment. Listen, have you ever seen anyone recovering from plastic surgery? Uh, no, only pictures. No. Where do they go? Hello, welcome to Apre Cosmetique. What does a woman look like when she comes out of getting cosmetic surgery? Well, uh, it's according to the job. If she's had her eyes done, that's probably the most uh, severe look because your eyes are swollen, sh practically shut, and that's a, that's a tough one. And they're rimmed with red, and they're rimmed with black, and they've got every color. I mean, you've got every color in the rainbow vividly uh, plastered all over your face, and you're swollen beyond recognition. Hello. Welcome to Apre Cosmetique. How are you feeling? Come right in. I had a patient here last week, was 33 years old. I find that rather startling. Um, she had everything. <laughs> she had a facelift, eyes, cheeks, nose, and liposuction on her rear end. It was really extraordinary. I was quite amazed. Have you ever seen anyone recovering from plastic surgery? Besides you? No. Do you have any feelings about plastic surgery one way or the other? No, I'm pretty neutral on the subject, actually, yes. Well, honey, you don't need it, so you can afford to be. Well, thank you, and I hope you recover. You have a tendency to look angry when you get older, and you're really not angry. You feel young, you feel wonderful, you feel vital, but yet your face is kind of hanging over there. And a friend and I have discussed this, and we, we decided that if you could stand on your head half your life, gravity wouldn't take over and you'd be safe. You would not need plastic surgery, but it, we can't do that. And gravity does take over, and there you are. Sometimes I'd be on the street or in my office or in a restaurant or once or twice on a television program and I'd be itching my nose and, and once or twice I have to admit what I pulled out of there would scare Freddy Krueger to death. It was so darn disgusting. One time, I don't mean to get gruesome, but you asked. <laughs> and you know, if you ask, I'll let you know. Um, I pulled out of my nose something that darn looked like an organ. I was afraid. I didn't, I didn't put it into a napkin. I put it into a piece of cellophane and immediately took it out and over to a doctor. I thought it might have been possible that I took out some kind of an organ. It was, it was looked like an organ. Turned out to be a deep wound scab. And when I took it to the doctor, he realized that I did have a nasal infection. Gave me some bastard treatment ointment. I was allowed to put that into my nostrils twice a day for a week, and I was fine. I haven't picked my nose since. Well, how about you giving us a demonstration okay. of how to brush a dog's teeth? Okay, now, what you can do, what my doggie, I found out, loved to brush his teeth since he was a puppy, is with my radius toothbrush, which is this huge toothbrush that was, and I'm not even going to show you how he's done it. And what, he's, what he did one day is he climbed up on the sink, and he just grabbed it, and he started bite, brushing with it. Oh, you don't want it now. Okay. Uh, you can also get a soft toothbrush. Always use a soft toothbrush when you're brushing the doggie's teeth. There he goes. Okay, and you can watch. First, he'll play with it, especially if it's your toothbrush. If it's been in your mouth, he'll take the toothbrush a lot faster. And once he gets used to that toothbrush being in his mouth, then you can direct it towards every single tooth. Okay, now, barring that, if, if the dog is too large and the brush is too small, he might do some damage, so you don't want to put such a small brush in his mouth. What they have, what I found on the market is something called an infident. Now, this is for babies, but I found it's terrific for these little New York City dogs. I will begin by simply introducing my wife, Julie Mitchell, who in turn will introduce to you the other participants in the program. It will be a program of music and drama and poetry. So now, Julie Mitchell. The sweetest name for the loveliest and holiest person and the only woman without sin, perfect in every way, was at one time on the earth. Now she reigns supreme in heaven. And 
is the mother of us all. Now to begin the readings from the book, Mary, Blessed Mother, we turn to Mary Eunice Spaniola. Uh, in our field of communications, we took the title Mary Productions in honor of the Blessed Mother because she played a part in the greatest drama of the ages. Truly, she's our spiritual mother. The poems I have selected tell of her simplicity and of her love. The first one, Love Was a Crib. Our Lady came to Bethlehem, side saddled on a donkey. She had no camel like the kings. She had no braided flunky. Every year, some 6,000 Americans choke to death on their food. And it would probably be a lot more were it not for the fact that Ed Koch, New York's legendary mayor from 1976 to 1989, almost went the same way too. As a result, he decreed that every New York restaurant would have to display something called the Heimlich Maneuver. Bill Judkins went and coughed up the story. Ed Koch is probably one of the most popular mayors the city has ever seen. His list of accomplishments ranged from pulling the city out of a financial crisis in the late 70s to authoring the best-selling book, Mayor. But it was here at 13 Mott Street, 10 years ago, at Ed Koch's favorite Chinese restaurant, that one of his most tasty bits of legislation came to be. Oh, I don't know, about 10 years ago, I was at uh, 13 Mott Street, uh, seafood Chinese, and suddenly, uh, while eating, I felt I couldn't breathe. And uh, I had something lodged in my throat, and I was choking. So I stood up, and I patted uh, on the shoulder one of my um, uh, restaurant companions, and I pointed to my throat, and he understood immediately. And he performed the Heimlich maneuver, and the food that I had ingested was ejected. If no one's there, you can use the end of a chair. It's the same thing. It just, just, uh, uh. Ah, I was looking for that Lee press on. And um, then what I did was to initiate a requirement that every restaurant in the city have a poster with the Heimlich Maneuver technique listed on it with a diagram so that waiters and others in such a similar case would know what to do. You have the sign? Yeah. We have the sign right here. Ah, I see. So yeah. if anything happened yeah. and somebody was yeah. eating. Yeah. If anything happened, we have the sign right here. Then uh, we learn over there. Then we tell the cut with how, how can we do, you know. Does anybody here know, uh, familiar with the Heimlich Maneuver? Well, the question was, uh, given to me, what was I eating? I'm Jewish, and I, but I don't happen to be kosher, and uh, so uh, the, one of the products that we were eating was uh, uh, barbecued spare ribs, and another one uh, was um, a spinach, sautéed spinach. And since I was running for office that year, is my recollection, I preferred to think it was the spinach, and so I said it was the spinach. Do you know what about the Heimlich maneuver? Do you yeah. know what it is? Yeah, people got choked, they grab in the stomach, just pulled it up. Uh huh. Could you show me how to do that? You're a little too tall. I don't be able to do that. <laughs> you have to do it hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You hook them with a with a flat piece here. Yeah. Right. <laughs> sort of like that. Squeeze it. With the hammer. Yeah. So you have to turn around. Okay. And so. If you're choking, mm -hmm. so then uh, what I do is this and then uh, like that. Ding! Did y'all know that Mayor Ed Koch was a closeted homosexual? Well, that's right, honey, he sure was. And check this out. He didn't come out of the closet until 10 years after he died. And uh, that motion will cause you to eject whatever it is that is Watercress. lodged in your throat. Watercress or uh, spinach or... Uh, barbecued spares. 
I think you're also much taller than I expected. Well, everybody thinks I'm short. I'm actually six foot one, and I weigh uh, 203 pounds, which is uh, two pounds more than I want to be. Uh, I had taken off a total of 40, but I gained uh, back about two. Taxi driver is allowed to throw you out of his cab. One, if you once you start cursing, we're allowed to throw you out. Two, if you get obnoxious, throw up, puke, defecate in the back, which I've had that happen. Do you ever have that happen to you? You've had somebody. I've had them puke, but not defecate. Yeah, I had uh, you know defecate right in the back seat, man. You know. What does that mean? You, you can't hear or defecate? What does that mean? <laughs> defecate, man. That's what he did, man. He took a dump right in my back seat, man. I'm, what the? You know. <laughs> and there I look in the back, and there's a nice little pile right there in the back of the seat. You see, it, I swear to God. Huh? How did he do this? I had a petition. Is the old someone telling you? I had a petition, a dirty petition. I could hardly <laughs> see through it. I'm like, I'm sniffing. I'm saying, what the hell's going on here, right? And I said, Jesus, guys, the guy must have really bombed her, you know. Yeah. Bombed, bombed. He gets out, and I'm got the windows down. I'm driving around. And like, the smell won't go away. I finally I get in the back seat. I look. I said, holy Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> ah. <laughs> You're right in the back seat. He dumped it on me. Uh, please, let, this be, let all the passengers watching. Listen, let's, let's, let's make this an isolated <laughs> incident. Okay. Yeah, I should tell you the story about the guy. <laughs> you know, it's a, you don't want any uh, copycat uh, guy gets in my numbers out Guy there, gets you know? in my cab one night and he says to me, yeah, you want to make some money. Hello, I'm Laurie Pike, back with more extracts from Manhattan's public access channels. Well, some. There are some things, like Voyeur Vision, for example, that we can't show you right now. So here's something less, less. But as my mom always told me, less is more. Empress Margot has convinced me, purely for the sake of education, to show what spanking is like and how she is a professional spanker. <laughs> She came this after being trained at with McDonald's? No, no. Get no, out of here. No. Come here. So, okay. So I'm tired of your insults. I'm, going to play I'm the tired game of your insults. Of, uh, Fuck this. Uh, go ahead, Margo. It was here. sexless spanking. I, I could open Close that. your. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Come you here. Don't, I don't Lady. care. It's going to embarrass you more if we show your little tiny wee wee. You want me to take my jacket? <laughs> Bend over. Bend over. Which oh. way? <laughs> Ooh, ooh, red shorts even. What a little whore you are. Oh, ooh. my God. Mm -hmm. You know what, guys? If you do what you love, you'll never have to work a day in your life. Ow! <laughs> oh, you thought you wouldn't like this, didn't I you? I love it. I knew you would. Oh, and his cheeks getting red already. You got his Show red business. cheeks. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, look at this golden opportunity. Oh, I knew you would be it. Get up. Who else wants to come in? Kathy? Any <laughs> <laughs> Cheeks for everyone. This is Dick Hughes saying stay tuned for an important announcement. We'll be right back. It's estimated that there are 90,000 homeless people living in New York, but not all of them live on the streets. In fact, some of them live in one of Manhattan's swankiest neighborhoods. Bill Judkins went uptown and down underground to investigate. This is the Upper West Side, one of Manhattan's wealthiest neighborhoods. There's high rises, parks, marinas, but there's a whole group of people that live here that are never seen. That's because they make their home underground in a long, vast railway tunnel that stretches for miles underneath the city. They call them the mole people. Had you been homeless before you lived down here? No, no. I, like I said, uh, a nonprofit organization moved in, took over my building. I was in the building itself for 15 years. Can you tell us how far the tunnel runs? Uh, the tunnel runs from 72nd Street here 
up to 125th Street, which is some 53 blocks. Uh -huh. uh, there are people scattered throughout the tunnel in various places. Some have built houses, some live in, in caves like I do. Others live higher up in caves. Uh, people just live wherever they can. The further north you go, uh, the more radical the people become. Uh, there are people who haven't been out of the tunnel except to buy food in months. Some of them are really nasty, and uh, most of them haven't even bathed in months. There's been three murders down here, uh, one accidental death, and one suicide, and that's in a year and a half. There's also been muggings, robberies, uh, and vandalism, such as arson. Uh, I personally have been burnt out four times, all my clothes destroyed, and had to start all over again. How long have you been living under? Uh, about a year and a half now. It started out as, I, I looked at it as an adventure, and it's turned into a tragedy. I lived down here in the tunnel for four years. I left the tunnel approximately two months ago. I come down here on a daily basis um, because two reasons. One, it's nice because I'm kind of like a PR man for the tunnel. Um, and I'm always around in case they need me. And the other one is because I figure if I don't come back, I won't remember where I came from and I could just end up here again as easily. One word we despise is being called mole people. It's like we don't look different than anyone else. And people say, okay, you don't want to be called mole people. What do you want to be called? We want to be called people. That's exactly what we are. I mean, when I was living down here, I dressed with a nice shirt and tie. I had a job, which I lost because my employer found out I was homeless. Um, if someone isn't living with someone else, they definitely have an animal. There's always that companionship that is needed down here. Um, someone that you can turn to, the affection, the caring, someone to talk to. Good evening, you're on the air. Hello, Sylvia. Hi, how can I help you? Hi, my name is Liz. Okay, Liz. My birthday is 32467. Okay, 1967. Uh-huh. Artist? No. Actress? No. What? Secretary. Secretary? Believe a couple of not. things? Do you do a couple of things at the office? Um, I guess so. That's the, the question if you're like about my career. Because you're very expedite, you're an expediter. Uh-huh. Okay? And you can do a number of things well at one time. What is your question about career? Um, I'm kind of floundering. I'm not sure really what I should be doing. You should be doing something else. Let's take a look. This is the time if you're going to change careers, you're going to do it now, this year. You're in a very, very important year, my dear friend. Very important. How old are you now? 23. Okay, 23. You know you're excellent in sales. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Okay. You're absolutely fabulous. Now, you've let go of your father somewhat? Uh, yeah, a long time ago. Okay. He was bugging you a long time, or was he the knight in shining armor and no one can compare to him? Uh, I don't know. He died when I was four years old. Okay. So you finally let go that you didn't have one, okay? You've I worked guess. that out now, right? Okay. Okay. Nine. Huh. Let me ask you a question yeah. very quickly. Any any bees? Are you Elizabeth? Uh huh. Okay. Are you of a dance? This is a clock. Can you say that? Oh, a clock. <laughs> oh, we'll place that right over there. Four. Four. We need to time. We need to time. This is, we need, we need to time the length of the show. You know, everyone has to have things in slots. Oh, speaking of which, 
Coffee. Coffee, welcome. Oh, notice the white, white china. Um, notice how china and the word white, in this instance, uh, are so remote. <laughs> I mean, this is so obviously French tile. This is so obviously, well, the porcelain combination thereof. <laughs> I love to lecture. Oh, wow, we've already traveled halfway around the world, and now we're back. <laughs> oh, dear. So, oh, let me take a sip. Excuse me, please. Mm. Mm. It's so delicious. <laughs> yes, indeed. Did you notice my outfit? Oh, please do. I'll stand, and I'll twist, and I'll turn, and back down into the top. Oh, a little divergence there. There's that word die again. <laughs> Divergence. Oh, well, this little ducky will never have to die. This little ducky, you know, I, I, I feel so, so sorry sometimes for that which has life. Well, because that which has life has to die. That which is dead is alive forever. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> I like Deaton. The serpent's still there, you know. God threw us out and kept everybody else. I was depressed for a month. I felt humiliated. Nobody even noticed we left. I heard that from the serpent. I realized you and I were totally dispensable. I'm amazed you talked to that silly snake. He convinced you to eat the fruit. He was right, of course, and made us intelligent as the angels, if not immortal. I think intelligence must be sinful or unethical. It certainly got God angry. Adam, why do you think God put the tree there? I never gave it a thought. I don't know why God does anything. Why did God create a blackberry? I don't know. Do you want some sodomite wine? I'd love some. The sodomites are superb winemakers. It'll go well with the honey with lentils I'm making for you. The Sunamites are inhospitable, otherwise they would have an enormous market for this vintage fair. We too have shown Eden to be childish, to exile. Nobody dishes the dirt like Kitty Kelly, and her new unauthorized biography of Nancy Reagan has everyone talking. We did a little of our own unauthorized investigation into the infamous First Lady's New York past. Most people wouldn't think of Queens, New York as fit for a queen, but it was here, in this house in fact, where Nancy Reagan spent the first two years of her life. We thought it might be interesting to come to her old neighborhood and see how it would fit in with her new life. I really can't see Nancy Reagan riding the subway with the common people, but if she did, the subway stop is just one block from where she grew up, so it'd be very convenient. In the White House, Nancy Reagan had her own beauty salon furnished free by Clairol, but if she moved back here, maybe she'd go to the Somos Hair People Hair Salon to get her hair dyed and coiffed. Did you know that Nancy Reagan used to live in this neighborhood? My friend told me last week. Really? I didn't know. If she came in, would you do her up for free? Oh, no, really? Oh, no, she had plenty of money. <laughs> I had to pay rent here. <laughs> and this would definitely, definitely be one of Nancy Reagan's first stops if she came back to the old neighborhood. According to Kitty Kelly, she was quite a clothing horse, and she loved couture. Since I know Miss uh, Nancy Reagan loves red, I will point something out for her. And it has a lovely neckline. Uh, let me show you the back of this uh, elegant gown. <gasps> this red dress would look fabulous, Nancy, at an AIDS fundraiser. Uh, where is she now, anyway? Oh, that's right. Hell, I forgot. She's burning in hell. And with Nancy's figure, I'm pretty sure she will look beautiful. If she wanted to borrow it and then just like bring it back the next day, would you let her do that too? No, we don't do that. So there you have it. And let's visit another little store in Nancy Reagan's neighborhood. Well, there's one story about her um, giving a teddy bear to a kid who actually lost that teddy bear in the White House earlier. Do you have teddy bears here? Oh, uh, yes, we have. Can you show them to me? Yeah, over there. Oh, there they are. There certainly is a large selection. $15.99. It's definitely within Nancy's budget. 
Um, but you know what? If someone lost this at the White House, it would get dirty, and you'd be able to tell, you know, because it's white. So she'd probably choose a darker one. This is awfully sweet. And it says, I love you. God bless our years together. Now, she could give that to Ronnie because she was very devoted. She's a very devoted wife. So let's visit a couple places on this main drag and see what Nancy might think of the old neighborhood now that it's new. What does it take to get a little service in this place? I just wanted to ask you a quick question. Apparently their favorite dish was crab meat and artichoke casserole, and then they changed it to macaroni and cheese. Do you serve either of these? Macaroni and cheese, yes, but with fish cakes. <laughs> now would you charge her for her meal if she came in? I would pay for it. Yeah, but I expect a good tip. <laughs> she said that she would pay for Nancy Reagan's dinner of Nancy. No. Of course, she's a customer. I'm going to treat her like I would treat anybody else, right? Yeah. What if she cried? Because she used to do that. According to this book, she would cry if someone wanted her to pay for something. Go to McDonald's. <laughs> would you be glad to see her in your shoe shop? Why not? Yes. Would you fix her um, um, designer shoes for free? Of course. What? Of course. She's not even first lady anymore. Yeah, so why not? Just the name. With all the money she has, you would give her free service while the poor people of Queens have to pay you. That's right. <laughs> Here we are in the bar that's literally right next to the house where Nancy Reagan grew up in her first two years. It's a typical Saturday night in Queens. People are boozing it up, playing pool. If she came in today, would you buy her a drink? Sure. Anything for a little old Nancy. What would you do if Nancy Reagan walked in the door? What would I do? I don't know. I might run out the back door because I wouldn't know what to say. Would you buy a drink, maybe? Well, I'd buy a, no, not a drink, a ginger ale. No drugs, no alcohol for Nancy Reagan. Yes. Can I have a date with you? He is obsessed with Madonna. He follows her everywhere, and for days on end, he stakes out her apartment on West 64th off Central Park. But that's not all. He's the ultimate Madonna wannabe, and he even dresses like her. He calls himself Queer Donna, and we got him to Vogue. I guess I could say I'm one of the biggest fans in the world. I followed Madonna to Michigan on her um, world tour. I tracked her down in one day and tracked her family's house down. It was a lot of fun. I kind of put on this, like, little, um, you know, her, her publicist's name is Lizbeth Rosenberg. Obviously, you all know that if you're a fan. And um, what I do is I call up the hotels and things, and I go, Hello, this is Lizbeth Rosenberg. When I first met Madonna, actually, not at her house, but, you know, at an event was Who's That Girl World Premiere on August 6th in 1987. And, you know, it was just great. And, you know, I cried my way into... um I absolutely cried my way into the theater. Did you know that Madonna, you know, walked out of a restaurant with Tony Ward? But the funny, funny part was is that, you know, she walked out and she put her head into her um, sweater. And a fan goes, hey, Madonna, what's the dog do? You know, dog shit. And she looked up and she just tripped and bumped her head into a pole. It was really, really funny. I've written a book, it's called Adventures with the Real Madonna, and I will be going around to publishers to talk about it. In my book, um, I cover various things. It, it covers where Madonna eats in New York, to, um, you know, what kind of cologne she wears, to... Who's that girl? Where she shops. You might even, you know, any of you fans who came down, um, might even be in, in the book. She sent me a shirt with, you know, the little Who's That Girl, uh, you know, Madonna cartoon on it. And a very, 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 very funny note. And the note reads, wear this shirt to bed at night, then tell everyone I slept with you. Love, Madonna.
media and Madonna's publicist, all these people create an image. They create the image Madonna that you see. The Madonna that you see on the street is a totally different person. Madonna, if you're watching, honey, um, watch out for me because I'm going to be the next divine. Welcome to the famous Jewel Box in Manhattan. Starring tonight, the famous, the one and only, Margarita, Madame. Hello, Bragadan, I love you. Thank you, baby. Hello, people, I love you. I love Bragadan. Para bailar la bamba, para bailar la bamba se necesita una cosa de gracia, una cosa de gracia y una cosita y arriba y arriba. Bamba bamba, bamba bamba. Bragadán, I love you. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. So listen guys, uh, when I was in New York in, uh, I guess 1994, 1995, when Madonna released her Bedroom Stories, Bedtime Stories album, Bedtime Story, singular album, she was doing this big concert, surprise concert at Webster Hall, okay? And around midnight or one o'clock when the club was just, it was insane with people. No one knew she was gonna be there. She descends from the ceiling on a bed over the dance floor and she's in her like nightgown and she's got this big book bedtime story you can imagine the crowd went absolutely insane crazy and she could not get them to shut up and she was starting to get very frustrated but of course we were all my dad oh my god and she was going quiet down you was like stop because she wanted to read a bedtime story but again i mean think about it it's 12 30 1 o'clock in the morning in new york in the east village on the crowded dance floor madonna descends on a bed in uh, lingerie and you expect us to be quiet well she finally got everyone settled down and she started reading the bedtime story. Once upon a time, long time ago, and a girl in the audience screams out, you go, girl! And without missing a beat, Madonna goes, I will go if you don't shut the fuck up. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Manhattan Cable. Who's that girl? Kianes S. Lacani, who's that girl? Kianes S. Lacani, la 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 la.